All right, so today we're going to again go over primal dual algorithms for min cost flow, and hopefully I will show you a polynomial time algorithm for min cost flow. Uh, before we do that, let me let me just recall a few things. Remember that the dual of uh, min cost flow, you know, is given by this uh, this distance label, right? So you basically have to find distance labels. Uh, which is called the potential with respect to the prices or the costs of each edge. <clears throat> now, recall a few things. Recall the augmenting graph, the, uh, the, um, the, the residual graph, not the augmenting graph. The residual graph of G of X is if you have a flow, and this might not even be a feasible flow, meaning it only routes some subset of the demand. Uh, then you keep all the edges as before, but for any edge that is sending flow, you put a reverse edge with a capacity of X UV and you put minus P UV, you negate the price, right? And so this edge now has a capacity because you can only send that much reverse flow, X UV reverse flow. This is the residual network. Now, one thing that we had discussed was this primal dual algorithm. Now, what is a primal dual algorithm? Unlike most algorithms that maintain a feasible solution and try to improve the optimum, here it goes the other way around. It maintains actually an infeasible primal point and a dual feasible point such that complementary slackness always holds. And so it's going to continuously reduce the infeasibility of X and it's going to update X and Y. And when X is finally feasible, it is automatically optimal because X and Y are a primal dual feasible pair which satisfy complementary slackness. What is the X that we are going to use? It's going to be a flow that does not satisfy all the demands. It's going to satisfy some of the demands. And remember that all the, um, uh, all the capacities are infinite. We're looking at a transshipment problem. So because the capacities are infinite, you know, we don't need to worry about capacity constraints. So what is the situation? Some vertices have some supplier demand left to route. And so we call it S of X and T of X. Script SX and script TX are the subsets of vertices. These are the supplies. These are the ones that have demand. So the sources and the sinks. So we have G of we have X, which is some partial flow. We have a dual feasible Y such that complementary slackness holds. And now we're going to try to route from SX to TX, maintaining complementary slackness. Now, a very key claim that we have, and I put this as an exercise, but this is sort of one of the most important claims that that's going to underpin all of this is, so remember, X and Y are going to satisfy the following conditions. So Y satisfies for all UV, Y of U is at most, Y of V is at most Y of U plus P UV. This is the dual feasibility. It's going to satisfy complementary slackness, meaning that if some edge is sending non-zero flow, then that constraint becomes an equality. Now, we have a residual graph, and we're going to use P hat to denote costs in the residual graph. And I'm going to use the phrase, Y is dual feasible with respect to the residual graph if the dual conditions hold for all edges in the residual. So that means that there are some edges that are backward edges, and this condition also holds for the backward edges. Now, what you can observe over here, and I've written this over here, is that if UV and VU exist in GX, meaning that there is backward flow, then actually the constraint becomes an equality. Y of U is equal, Y of V is equal to Y of U plus PUV. And so complementary slackness will hold. So the claim is if Y is dual feasible with respect to GX, which is the this definition I've given above, then X and Y satisfy complementary slackness. Now, the reason why this claim is useful is now I will just ensure that I maintain dual feasibility with respect to GX. Okay. Now, the first primal dual algorithm I gave, and I did not do it in full detail because I'm going to do a more detailed one today, a different, a slightly different, call an edge an equality edge if y of v is equal to y of u plus p u v. Okay, this is an equality edge of the network. 
if there is a, so in this case, we don't even need the residual network. It's just useful to look at this. If there is a path of equality edges from a source to a sink, you route flow along that path. Why can you route flow? Because complementary slackness will be maintained if you route along equality edges. Now what we said is when do you get stuck? Well, you get stuck if there is no path of equality edges from a source to a sink. That means the inequality edges form a cut between the sources and the sinks. And then I don't want to go over this again. Well, there was a way of increasing the dual variables. And by that, you could reduce the inequality edges. You would get more equality edges and you keep repeating this. This was the basic primal dual algorithm. So what I'm going to do now is to sort of given that, you know, I've given an intuitive description of what is going on here, give you a fancier primal dual algorithm, which has a better runtime and from which we'll get actually a weekly polynomial time algorithm. But any questions at this point about this, any doubts that you have, this is a good time to ask because now I'm going to go deeper into this. Any questions? No? All right. Maybe I should have checked earlier, but you can see my screen and you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So now let's, let's take this idea further. Let's take this idea further. Um, so, so we have this notion of equality edges. And these are edges where yv was at most yu plus puv, right? And you said, here are the sources, here are the sinks, right? So this is sx, this is tx. And so we had some, if there were equality edges, you could, I'm sorry, equality edges have this property. All edges, For all edges, yv is at most yu plus puv. This is dual feasibility. Okay, this is dual feasibility. And I'm thinking of an edge uv, right? So here is u, here is v. And that's the edge. This is an edge of the original graph. Okay, let me now restate this in a convenient form. Let me just say that the weight of an edge, which I'll call W U V, that's the weight of an edge. Let me just say that this weight of an edge is Y U plus P U V minus Y V. Okay, that's the weight of an edge. What can you say about the weight? Positive, non-negative, zero, what? Non-negative. For equality edges, it's zero. For equality edges, it's zero. Otherwise, it's non-negative, right? So it, the weight is non-negative. Good. So we would like a path of zero weight from s of x to t of x like that would be the ideal if we had a path of zero weight from s of x to t of x instead instead so suppose now previously what we said is if we don't have a path of zero weight we're going to change the dual let me try a different idea Suppose we route flow on a shortest path. And this is inspired by this. If there is a path of zero weight, then obviously it's a shortest path. But if there isn't a path of zero weight, then let's just look at the shortest path and try to fix the dual. A shortest path from 
a source to a sink. So we route flow on a shortest path from a source to a sink. So that's going to be our idea. That is going to be our idea. So let me now write something con concrete over here. Let me say for all t in t of x, sigma t is equal to the shortest path distance according to the W weights. Now this is according to the W's that I defined. Recall in the W's you can think of as sort of like the slack in, in the constraint. So let sigma t be the shortest path distance from any source to t. Okay. How much time does it take to compute all the sigma t's? How much time to compute all the sigma t's? Yeah, any thoughts? So here's s of x, sx, and here's some t, right? And this is tx. And what you want is the shortest path distance from any vertex in Sx to T. And you want this information for all Ts. How long? How long to compute? Remember, all the weights are non-negative. And this is important, right? Weights are non-negative. How long to compute? N log N. M log N. Why? Because uh, we can just do like dextras on the whole thing. You could do dextras on the whole thing. Good. But let's be a little careful here. So your answer is right, but you need more justification because how do you get the shortest path distance from any source to T? So you have the right answer, but you need a construction to do it. It's a very simple trick, but do you, see, do you see the issue? You need to get from any source to T. Can you not start from T and then work backwards? Okay, so you could, good. So you could get the shortest path distance for a single T using Dijkstra, which means you're gonna have to do Dijkstra N times. Does that make sense? What if you want to do it with one call of Dijkstra? Yes, any, any suggestions on how you could do it with one, one call of Dijkstra? Think backwards, right? Get to a, get to any source to a sink. How do you get from any source to a sink? We've done this trick before. Add a super source. Put edges from the super source of weight zero. Then sigma t is exactly the shortest path distance from little s, the super source, to t. Does that make sense? So my the claim is we can compute all sigma t values in O of m log n and this is by using Dijkstra. I'll leave the formal proof as an exercise, but hopefully you see the argument, right? You have a super source connected to everything. 
And if you look at the shortest path distance from this little s to t, it is exactly sigma t. So we can actually compute all the sigma t's in m log n. One run of Dijkstra and you get all the sigma t values. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. So now what we have is we have some source and we have some sink. Let's just pick some sink. And um, I'm going to sort of, um, you know, maybe what I should have called this was, I should have called this S bar um, just to give it a different name. And so here is some source to sync, and here is the shortest path. Okay, so I could go ahead and route as much flow as possible from S to T. I can route as much flow as possible from S to T, and technically I can do this in the residual. Right, I can do this in the residual. So let me go back one second. Let me go back. And let me say, if I did all of this in the residual, I could do this with respect to the hats and everything would hold because I, because I know that whatever I have is feasible, dual feasible with respect to the residual as well. Okay. So this is not going to be a problem either. Okay. Okay. So I compute all these values and I go from S to T and so I can try to route flow. from S to T, updating X. Okay, so now what is the problem? So now what do I need to do? So I can go ahead and route flow and complementary slackness might fail. Complementary slackness is only going to fail on one of these edges. So on one of these edges, complementary slackness might fail. So let me refer to this, this path as S going from V0, V1, up to V of K, which I refer to as T. Right? So this is my path. <clears throat> and why is complementary slackness going to fail? Because if y of vi plus 1 is strictly smaller than y of vi plus p hat of vi, vi plus 1, then complementary slackness fails. So I need to find some values y I need to find, so what I need to do is I need to find I need to find some sort of y prime such that y prime of vi plus 1 is equal to y prime of vi plus p hat of vi and vi plus 1. Where would I get these values from? Any, any thoughts? I mean, I went ahead and I computed shortest path distances. Where could I get these values from? What are the new values that I've computed? What are the new values that I've computed? Yes, I've computed these new sigma t's. Let me see if I can use the sigma values. Okay, so what do I have for the sigma values? So sigma v of i plus 1 is equal to sigma v of i plus what? All right, someone tell me what is, what is it going to be equal to? These are shortest path distances and this is a shortest path.
Okay. Um, it's going to be the weight. Of the weight. Way. Exactly. So it's going to be that plus the weight of VI, VI plus 1. Let me open this up. Sigma VI plus what is the weight? All right, so the weight you saw is right here. So I'm just going to write that weight down is Y of VI plus P hat VI VI plus 1 minus Y of VI plus 1. And if I rearrange, then I get something very nice. I get Y of VI plus 1 plus Sigma VI plus 1 plus y of vi plus sigma vi plus p hat vi vi plus 1. So this now gives me my y prime. It's almost magical. So once I get my shortest path distances on the weights, I can essentially use those sigma variables, add them to the old dual variables, and I maintain complementary slackness. Is this clear? Any questions? Is this, this is a bit of magic here. It's a bit of magic here. Any questions about that? So good, I can go ahead and do my update. I can update everything in the path by adding these. So am I done now? Let me go ahead and add all of these so I can update the dual variables. That should take care of complementary slackness. But I claim I'm not done. There's still a problem. So what is the problem? What is the problem of only updating the dual variables along the path? Any, any thoughts? You have to satisfy a complementary slackness for the other variables. So for the other edges, I already maintain complementary slackness from before. Right, because in my initial solution had the only complementary slackness conditions changing are the ones along the path. So I claim that complementary slackness is not going to be my problem. So if complementary slackness is not the problem, then what's the other problem? Mismatch in supply and demand. The supply and demand is actually okay because what I did was the supply and demand is just going to be routed, right? So I have routed some supply to some demand and so there's no mismatch with the flow. Let's go back to what a primal dual algorithm does, right? I have to, what do I have to maintain? Like let's walk, let, let someone tell me, what do I have to maintain in the primal dual algorithm? An invisible prime primal point and a feasible dual point. So, sorry, say that again. Um, at least this is what you mentioned when you introduced the primal dual algorithm. Yes. You said that you need to maintain 
and invisible primal points x and right. a feasible dual exactly so i need to maintain a feasible dual point y now maintaining an infeasible primal point is kind of easy right sure it's just it's just going to stay infeasible but when i change values is my dual point going to remain feasible? I'm, I can keep complementary slackness, but why is feasibility going to fail? Let me draw an edge and maybe you'll see the answer. Suppose there was an edge of this form. What is gonna to happen to the value? Suppose you only updated along the path. You might increase the value so let's just say this is some V, and I'm going to call this U. Now, what do we need to maintain? We need YV is at most YU plus P hat UV, where again, P hat was with respect to this, um, the residual net. I needed to maintain this property. Now, because of changing the dual on the path, I might increase YV. And if I increase YV, then this constraint might break. And so it's not dual feasible any longer. Does that make sense? Yes, no, this is a good point to ask questions if you're confused about this. Remember, the dual variables y have to be feasible, so they have to satisfy all of these constraints. But if you selectively increase the values along some path, you might break these constraints along other edges where you did not increase along the other endpoint. So one has to actually increase the dual variables potentially everywhere. So what could, we could do the same thing. It turns out that for all edges, this holds with an inequality. And so you could update everywhere. So you could potentially add the sigma v to every vertex, every vertex, not just the ones along the path. Is this making sense? So any yes, no, any questions? Raise your hand if you understand sort of what I'm saying, if this is, if you're following this discussion. Okay, so those of you who aren't like, go ahead and feel free to interrupt me at any point and ask me questions about what's going on because we now need to update the dual everywhere. We have yet another problem. This is kind of a strange problem, which is what if sigma u for some u is equal to infinity? And that's possible, right? So maybe in this shortest path setting here, there exists no path. Maybe there is some, some vertex here, which is neither a source nor a sink, which is neither a source nor a sink. And there was no way of getting from S to here. Then for any such U, sigma U is going to be infinity. And you cannot start adding infinities to your dual solution. Otherwise, you know, it's just invalid. This means that there actually is, there's no distance 
because there's no edge that goes from that that you know there, there's no way that you can reach uh, sigma u. Okay, so you have to be a little careful to deal with these cases, and it turns out that there's actually there's a relatively simple solution, a clean solution. It's it's not simple. It's a clean solution. I'll prove it. So let, I will go ahead and write down the idea. But the idea is, again, I hope you get it. You add the sigma v's to y v's, except now you need to worry about things like infinity. So you basically cap it at some point. Okay. So I'm going to sort of, uh, I'll just say that um, sigma min is equal to the smallest sigma t over t in t of x, right? So it's basically the min over t in t of x of sigma t. So this is like the closest sink, which makes sense that you want to route to the closest sink. The claim is updating y v. So I'll say y v prime is the new dual value. This is the update equal to y v plus the min of sigma v and sigma min. So it maintains dual feasibility in the new residual graph g of x, g of x prime. Okay, so maybe I, let me just be clear over here. So you chose sigma min to be the smallest t over all t in t of x. You go ahead and you route, route the flow from s to t, where the t is this min, is the argument. This gives you the new flow x prime. And updating will maintain the dual feasibility in the new residual graph. And as we argued earlier, I'll just pull that up. If y is dual feasible with respect to g of x, then x and y will satisfy complementary slackness. So all I need to do is to maintain the dual feasibility with respect to the new residual network. So now let me prove this. And so part of the proof you have already seen So g of x prime, let me refer to this path as p, has new backward edges along p. Otherwise, g of x prime is the same as g of x. So we need to maintain equality edges along the path p. Right? And this is equivalent to dealing with the backward edges. So we just need to maintain equality edges along the path p. And this, in some sense, we already argued, but I'm just going to write it down uh, to be sure. So s was equal to v0, v1, up to vk, which was equal to t. 
Now, y of vi plus 1, y prime of vi plus 1 is going to be equal to y of vi plus 1 plus the min of sigma vi um, let me make sure I'm doing this uh, correct right sigma vi plus 1 sigma min but this is the shortest path so sigma vi plus 1 is at most sigma min right because sigma min is the distance up to here and sigma vi plus 1 is the distance up to some intermediate node so clearly the min of those those two things is just going to be sigma vi plus 1 so for anything along the path i have y of vi plus 1 plus sigma vi plus 1 that's what the y prime is going to be and so by previous calculation by the previous calculation um, the dual feasibility which is equivalent to complementary slackness the dual feasibility in g of x prime is equivalent to complementary slackness is maintained on the path p so we've taken care of the path now we need to argue about all the other edges Okay, now we need to argue about all the other edges. So now let's just pick some edge UV. We're going to pick some edge UV. And um, I'm going to say case one is, let me see if I get my cases correct over here. Okay, so let me first write something down over here. So y of v prime, I need to show, I need to show y of v prime is at most y of u prime, uh, I'm sorry, y prime of v is at most y prime of u uh, plus p hat of u v. And I know that y prime of u minus y prime of u this is going to be equal to y of v plus the min of sigma v sigma min minus y of u plus the min minus the min of sigma u sigma min plus p hat u v. Okay, and um, Make sure I'm doing this correctly. I'm sorry, no, just this. All right, so this is what I get. Now I know that this y of v minus y of u, this is at most p hat u v because this was dual feasible in g of x. This is the original. And so I just need to worry about the second part over here, which is the min of sigma v and sigma min minus the min of sigma u and sigma min. And I need to argue that this additional part, if I can argue that the additional part is strictly less than zero, or as at most zero, then I'll be in good shape. But overall, I need to argue that y v prime minus y u prime, which is this large quantity here, is at most p hat u v. Okay, so case one is let's say sigma u is less than or equal to sigma v. So let me kind of draw this out on a line. So here is sigma u, here is sigma v. Now within this case there are three possible cases which is where does sigma min lie? So sigma min could be here Sigma min could be here, or sigma min could be here. Okay? Someone tell me why this case is easy. 
Why is this case easy? It's just zero be zero. Exactly. This is going to become zero. Right? So in this case, in this case, the min of sigma v sigma min is equal to the min of sigma u sigma min. So the additional thing that I'm adding is zero. Okay. Uh, good. Why is the first case? What about the first case? First case, you have to think about a little bit. So what happens in the first case is it exactly becomes like the previous calculation. This is a little subtle, but let me write this down over here. So in this case, when sigma min is more, then yv prime minus yu prime is equal to yv plus sigma v minus yu minus sigma u. And if you if you rearrange if you rearrange things, you will exactly get the difference between well you, you have to okay, so maybe I'll maybe let me write this down. Let me write this down formally so that it's it's clear. So sort of redoing the same calculation, but I think it's worth seeing multiple times. Let me get the focus in. Okay, so yv plus sigma v minus yu minus sigma u. Now we know by short by the shortest path distance, by the shortest path distances, sigma v is at most sigma u plus w u v. And so sigma v is at most sigma u. And if you look up what w u v is, uh, that was basically y v plus p hat u v minus, uh, I'm sorry, y u minus y v. Right? And so if you rearrange, you rearrange what you got over here, what you get is this is at most p hat u v as desired. So that is the case when sigma min is more. Then you have to deal with the case where sigma min is in the middle. And you know, it turns out that this is exactly this is going to be the same the same situation because what you get is so in this sort of middle setting, in the middle setting, uh, what you get is y v plus min of sigma v sigma min minus y u minus min of sigma v and sigma min. This is exactly, I'm sorry, this is y. This is exactly sigma u. This is equal to sigma u. And this is at most sigma v. So what we get is this is at most y v plus sigma v minus y u minus sigma u, which we proved above was at most p hat u v. So in all of these settings, we get our desired bound. So the dual feasibility holds. Case two is sigma v is less than or equal to sigma u. The argument is pretty much identical. I leave it as an exercise. It's a fairly simple exercise, but it's worth doing. It's just work, you know, sort of walking over things because, the, you know, the signs are going to be flipped, but essentially you get the same issue. Remember, this is different because the edge is still going to be from u to v. So you have to do the opposite case, um, but it's, it's exactly the same, it's exactly the same math. And while the algebra in some sense is mechanical, the insight was quite deep, is that you can essentially use the shortest path distances with this cap. Like you have to take this min, 
to get everything. You, you have to take the min with, with sigma x to get everything to work. And so what you get is that um, the dual is feasible in um, g of x. Okay, so that completes that proof. So what this means is that if I update the dual in this method, then I maintain dual feasibility in the new residual graph. With this, I now have my primal dual algorithm, which let me write out in detail. So I'll say that X and Y are initial primal, which is potentially infeasible, and dual feasible points with, you know, complementary slackness. So this is an initialization. The way I'm going to describe the algorithm is with an initialization. Typically, you initialize x just being 0. So there's just 0 flow. And why you do it using like Bellman Ford. And this we described in the previous lecture, how you can use Bellman Ford to basically get some potentials in the beginning. So now here is the primal dual algorithm. So primal So here's the primal dual algorithm with x and y. So we'll just say while x is not feasible, so we have supply and demand left. What we'll do is we'll construct g of x. We'll set the weight of u v to be equal to. Um, I'll just make sure that I write these expressions properly. Uh, y u, uh, y u plus p hat u v minus yv. So we'll just set the weight to be that. Then using using Dijkstra compute all the sigma t values and then find a t minimizing sigma t route flow to that t right and update x so this is the primal update and then the dual update will be for all v set yv to be equal to the original yv plus the min of sigma t and sigma v. So this is the primal dual algorithm. So for every augmentation, there is one run of Dijkstra. For every augmentation, there is one run of Dijkstra and you kind of keep doing the updates. The theorem, which should be, at this point, you know, we can piece it together from everything that we've written. Primal dual G X Y computes the optimal in time O of M times D log n where d is the 
total demand in g of x or x, whichever way you want to look at it, right? So it says that because every, this is assuming, assume integer, um, integer costs and demands, demands and supplies. Right, so assuming everything is an integer, every time you run one iteration, you will route one unit of flow, at least one unit of flow. And so potentially the number of iterations could be the total demand, the total amount of flow that needs to be routed. For every unit of flow, you have to do one calculation of Dijkstra, that's the m log n. Okay, so this is the basic primal dual algorithm. It is, it's an exponential time algorithm, but I will now get into how to make it, how to make an improvement. But any questions about, about this algorithm as is? Any questions? So we have the primal dual algorithm that computes the optimum in time O of M D log N, where D is the total demand. And so what we're now going to do is we're gonna introduce a new idea, a very neat idea called scaling. And what scaling is going to do is to get us from O of M D log N, it's going to convert that into O of M log D log N. So we'll actually get log of the demands as opposed to the total demand. And this is weakly polynomial time. And because the number of operations actually is gonna depend on the, on the demand, on the value of the demand, but it's, it's logarithmic, so it's weakly polynomial time. There is also a strongly polynomial time algorithm, but I'm not going to get into that. So let me discuss scaling because I think scaling is a very neat trick that is used in a lot of uh, in, in these optimization problems. So I'm gonna write this as your instance is G C B. So what are these? These are the capacity, these are the costs or the, the prices. So maybe I'll refer to this as P. This is the cost or the price. And B was the demands, the demand or supply. So I'm just going to refer to my instances, this triple G, P, B, the graph, the costs, and the demand supply. Now we can scale the instance by delta, meaning we set B of V, so you take any vertex and you just set its demand, which um, by B divided by delta rounded down. So I'm just gonna scale it down. And what scaling is gonna do is, it's gonna sort of reduce the demands everywhere. And the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna solve that scaled instance and use the scaled solution to solve the original instance. And if you kind of do this carefully, then you can actually reduce the dependence on the total by just getting a logarithmic dependence. So very, it's a, it's a fairly clever, clever trick. Okay, so, but once you do this, unfortunately, the total demand might not equal the total supply. Okay, so you could have the situation where the total demand is not equal to the total supply. And let me give you a very simple scenario where that happens. So maybe you have one vertex and let's just say that it's B S, this is equal to K. 
And then you may have k vertices where all of them are like minus one. Like these are the sinks, this is the source. And so there could be k of these. So clearly this is satisfiable. But if you scaled by, let's say two, if you scaled by two, then you would basically make all of these zero and you would make this k over two and then it would not be satisfiable anymore. I should say, I mean, technically, also say like you take the absolute value, right? So you scale on the absolute value and then you can put back whatever appropriate sign there is, whether it's a supply or demand. So the total demand might not equal to the total supply. So the scaled instance might not even be feasible. So you have to be a little careful. So what we can do is we'll just create a dummy source in a sink to handle the situation. So what we'll say is that we'll start with our graph We'll add this dummy source S bar and T bar. And we'll just put edges to everything. So the costs are all zero. So all costs are zero. So the new edges have cost zero. And what these do is these will just suck up the extra demand or push in the extra supply that is required. So we'll say if G P B scaled by Delta has um, well, I'll, I'll, I will, uh, maybe the way I should do this is, yeah, so I'll say if it's scaled by delta, if scaled by delta has extra supply, I'll just call it X, then set the demand of T prime to be X and if it has extra demand of X, then set the demand of S hat to be X. I'm sorry, set the supply. Right, so this is just saying that you can pump in some extra flow just to set everything. And the extra price is just going to be zero. Right, because this vertex can send it to anywhere. So you can just set it up so that whatever excess is there, that can just be taken care of. I'm going to refer to this new instance, refer to this instance as GPB delta. This is the scaled instance. So GPB is the original instance and delta is the scaling. So I'm gonna cut down all the sources and the supplies by this factor delta, but because of rounding issues, I'm gonna have slight, I'm gonna have errors now. Now the total supply is not gonna be equal to the total demand. So I'm just gonna put an extra super source of super sink with exactly the right amount that's left over to handle that. It's still not clear that whatever I could route before I can route now, but it turns out that that is true. So I will write this out as a claim and I'll say that if GPB is feasible, um, is feasible and has an optimum, then GPB delta is also feasible and has an optimum. This isn't immediately obvious because once you scale everything, you know, maybe you have screwed up the feasibility or optimality conditions. Note that you're not gonna affect the optimality conditions because optimality was with respect to having a negative weight cycle and you're not changing the prices at all. The costs are the same. So there's, if there was no negative weight cycle before, there's gonna be no negative weight cycle after scaling. 
But there are some maximum in cut conditions. And so the proof of this is technically you have to use the maximum in cut to argue that the new instance is also feasible. Formally speaking, you can prove this claim by another claim in the past. I'm going to sh just show you that claim and I'm going to leave this proof as an exercise. Um. Let me just get my notes out here and So way back when I had this claim that I said the min cost flow is feasible if the total supply is equal to the total demand and for all sets that have no edges going out, they have to be more sink than source. So if you recall this lemma, you're using this lemma, you can, because it's an if and only if, you can use this condition to actually show the feasibility. You can use this condition to show the feasibility. I'm not going to do it. It's it's sort of it's a technical calculation. It's not particularly hard, so I'm going to leave this as an exercise. Believe me that the scaled instance is also feasible. Okay. So what? How are we going to make this? How are we going to pull this off? So the idea is the following: solve G um, C. B, two to the K minus one. So scale it, divide everything by two to the K minus one to get the optimum X comma Y. This is the optimal primal and dual solution. You can use the dual, so use any algorithm to get this. Now run primal dual on G, C, B, so I should actually said, sorry. So you scale it with two to the K. Now you reduce the scaling. Initialized, initialized with the optimum solution that you got in the first step, because this is a primal dual feasible pair for this instance. Why is dual feasible? And the dual has nothing to do with the demand. Well, okay, it has something to do with the flow. So sorry, I take that back. But the the the, du the primal dual pair over here satisfies complementary slackness and Y satisfies dual feasibility. So you can use that to initialize and technically you initialize with 2X, Y. And I, I will explain why that is the case. So what you do is you solve a large scale instance. So you do a huge amount of scaling, which means you reduce all the sort of the demands and supplies. You get a crude estimate. That's X, Y. A crude, you can think of it as a, like a crude optimum. And then you use that as your initial point for, um, for you know, when you scale it with two to the K minus one. And you keep repeating this and you have log n it log of the total demand iterations. You have log of the total demand iterations. And what I will argue is that this instance here can be solved efficiently. This instance can be solved efficiently. So let me kind of explain why, why this is going to happen. Let me say that BV for convenience, I'm going to say BVK is BV divided by two to the K. Okay, this is just for convenience. Now it's a simple calculation to see that BV of k minus one is equal to either two to the b v of k or two to the b v of k plus one. All right? This is just it's like an odd and even thing. So when I divide by two to the k, two to the k minus one, I will get twice of this, maybe plus one or not. Okay, and so. Um, the claim is if x, y is an optimal solution for 
g c b two to the k. Then two to the x times y is a feasible initialization for g c b two to the k minus one because I multiply this by two because let's say I've already I'm already routing b v k minus one units of flow I'm I'm sorry b v k units of flow I already know how to route that so. I want to route, I can route double of that. I would just take care of its demand in the first case, or I might have one demand left in the second case. But in any case, this would be a feasible initialization for GCB two to the K minus one. So I'll just write this as a claim that I'll leave as an exercise. And maybe the interesting claim over here is that the running time of, how much time do I have? Yeah, okay. The running time of primal dual on G C B two to the K minus one initialized with two times X Y, where X and Y are defined as before is just O of M N log N. And you can kind of see why. So the runtime is O of M D log N, where D is the demand in G of two times X, right? Because I'm already initializing with this flow. And if you recall what we proved before is what we proved in the primal dual is that the running time is O of M D log N where D is actually the total demand. So D is whatever needs to be routed. So the point is what needs to be routed here is not going to be that much. And that's because for vertex V with demand B V K minus one with, with initial with sort of the initial demand, the demand in G of two X is B V of K minus one minus two times B V of K, because that's exactly what X is. X is already routing two times B V of K, and this is at most one. So the total demand is at most n, and that completes the proof. So the point is that the running time of the primal dual algorithm when you initialize with the solution of the previous scaling is O of mn log n. And so now that I have O of mn log n, I would just repeat this, I just do recursion on this idea. So this, um, sorry, this algorithm is referred to as successive scaling. So I'll say this is successive, the successive scaling algorithm. And this is also by Edmonds and Karp. Uh, the scaling idea is Edmonds and Karp. I believe the previous one was might have been by Fulkerson Ford or, or some others, which, um, which I'm forgetting right now. So let me just write out the basic idea. So let capital K be the log base two of BV. And you know, maybe we can, so I'll just say it's actually, it should be the max. So you just look at the maximum demand and so we let x equals zero, y is equal to a feasible dual. This was Bellman Ford by one Bellman Ford calculation. And then we'll say for little k going from 
capital K all the way to zero, you know, use primal dual on G C B scaled by two to the little k starting with two x and y and now let x y denote the new optimum and so you just keep repeating this and then finally you just output you just output x y as your final solution and so note that each primal dual run over here runs in mn log n and there are at most k capital k of these iterations and capital k is at most log of the total demand um, and so that basically gives the solution and i'll just write this out formally as a theorem you can write this out formally as a theorem is that the successive the successive scaling algorithm solves a transshipment a transshipment instance in time O. So it's O of MN log N times log of D where D is the total demand. Maybe I should say log of d plus one, just to make sure that you know, this is not zero. And so this gives us a weekly polynomial time algorithm for the transshipment problem. There are strongly polynomial time algorithms, which actually interestingly also use scaling. They actually build on top of scaling on the successive scaling algorithm, but try to set it up in such a way that the actual demand does not, uh, does not appear. Uh, usually those algorithms will pay an extra factor of, of n on top of this. And that was, I think it was an open question for a while and Tardish had the first algorithm. So I'm not going to cover that. I will end the discussion, whatever my lecturing on min cost flow uh, with, with this. So hopefully what, you know, what you've seen is the use of the dual in many different ways. One is just to check feasibility and then you see how complementary slackness and the dual variables are used in a very clever way to give these primal dual algorithms. And leading up to a weekly polynomial time algorithm for the transshipment instance, and you can use this to solve any min cost flow problem. So with this, I'll end and I'll take any questions that you have.